Hi there, Logan Clements here, and in this week's episode, we are talking all about what event planners need to know about DMOs. Think destinations, figuring out where you want to host your next event. We are sitting down with friend of the pod, Nancy Small from Tourism Richmond, and this is Richmond, Canada, BC, British Columbia, not Richmond, Virginia, and it is such an exciting conversation. She gets really real on there about the value that a DMO can bring to your event, when to get them involved. And spoiler alert, we're also going to talk a little bit about how amazing our trip was. So you're probably going to want to go visit after you listen to this week's episode. Without further ado, let's get into it. Welcome to the Better Events Podcast. Join two event strategists, Logan Clements and Mary Davidson, who believe we can all create, host, and attend better events. In this podcast, you will learn about event strategy and actions that you can use today as an event host, planner, or manager. Hear directly from the people who are creating innovative and inspiring events today and tomorrow and grow your business along the way. Now, let's get started and thanks for listening to the Better Events Podcast. Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of the Better Events Podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Logan Clements, and I'm joined by fellow co-host Mary Davidson and we have a very exciting guest this week to tell you all that you need to know about DMOs. So I want to save as much time as we can for our amazing partner of the podcast, Tourism Richmond, and Nancy, their CEO, Nancy Small. So Mary, do you want to introduce our audience to Nancy? Yes, I certainly do. So Nancy is our guest who's originally from St. John's, Newfoundland. Nancy has worked all over the world, including stints in the Netherlands, Toronto, and Sydney, Australia. With an extensive background in the tourism industry, she specializes in strategic planning, destination development, stakeholder engagement, business development, and marketing strategy, all very important things. And Nancy is also very active in the tourism industry and in the Richmond community. She's also the current CEO of Tourism Richmond, and she's very passionate about all things Richmond and loves its diversity of food, the biking trails, culture, and shopping. Nancy, we're so excited to have you with us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Fantastic to be here. Really, really happy to uh, to see you just up the road in the Pacific Northwest. So uh, great to, uh, to see you ladies today. Absolutely. Yeah. We love to kick off first, Nancy, with telling our listeners why why we have you here. So we've been so excited that Tourism Richmond, uh, you guys have been a great partner so far of the podcast. We had the honor of getting to actually go up to Richmond, BC, uh, just recently in May, and get to experience a lot of what we're gonna we're gonna talk about here. Um, and we just really loved connecting with you both in person, and couldn't wait to have you on the podcast because I just think you're. You're a wealth of knowledge for our listeners here about DM, DMOs. And I, I mean, we're going to personally say everyone should go to Richmond, which that's a given. Be, that's a yeah. given. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. And I think we need to first start by just setting setting the record straight, which Richmond we're talking about, because I mentioned <laughs> you before we recorded. I went to both Richmond, Virginia and Richmond, BC within two weeks of each other. So if you want to first share, which which Richmond are you coming to us from? Well, I guess the drum roll is this is Richmond, British Columbia. So uh, on the west coast of Canada, uh, Pacific Northwest. And uh, it's uh, really exciting to be just, you know, about two and a half hours north of Seattle. Uh, Vancouver is our closest neighbor. I'm sure you've heard of Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. And we are uh, very close neighbors. In fact, we've separated just by a bridge. Uh, but our friends in Richmond, in Virginia, um, also a wonderful destination. Uh, but sometimes, sometimes there's a little confusion. Uh, there's actually over a hundred Richmonds in the world, believe it or not. Uh, but the one that I represent and the one that I'm going to be talking to you today is the one in British Columbia, Canada. So hope that clears up any confusion uh, with your audience. That's super helpful. And I think we both learned something new today, Logan, right? Like I had no idea that there were so many Richmonds, but we loved our experience in Richmond, British Columbia, and so we're excited to hear more about your experience there as well, Nancy. And a place that we really, really love to start is at the very beginning, which is like really basic. And so could you define a DMO for us? Yeah, it's it's a great question to start with. Um, a DMO it has evolved the the evolution of the term and actually of the of, of organizations has evolved through the years. Originally, starting out as you know, visitor sent visitor uh, board CVV, CVB might be a term that many people are familiar with. Uh, the current, I guess, uh, no more of them is destination marketing organizations, or destination marketing and management organizations, 
or just destination organizations. And essentially what we do is we operate as kind of the representative, if you will, uh, for the city, the destination, the location um, in whatever activities we do, whether that be in business events or in destination marketing or within destination management and destination stewardship. Essentially, we're kind of the catalyst within the community that works through all levels of government and all levels of industry and within the community as well, within residents. So, so we see ourselves really as kind of that central point um, within, within the destinations. So, so the term DMO or DO or CBB, sometimes they're a little interchangeable and, and really it depends on the location and the destination as to what the best term is for that particular uh, city. In our world, in uh, British Columbia and in Canada, we do tend to gravitate to the term DMO or DO, destination organization. So, um, but but it's not meant to be confusing. It's just meant to say, this is what these particular organizations do. And the funding models are often very different depending on, again, the destination. But really the thing that weaves us and that brings us all together is we're representing the community and industry, and we're really trying to benefit the community through the, the activity and the business development activities that we do, because it really is all about the community, because without the community, there's no DMO, there's no CBB, there's no tourism Richmond. Uh, the community is at the heart of everything that we do. That's so important. And we love community here on the podcast. So I, I know it's very intertwined and I appreciate you. I think sometimes the event industry has a lot of jargon and uh, these acronyms we like to use without defining them. So it sounds like we might be saying DMO or DO in this episode, and we we mean the same thing there, um, just for, yeah, our, exactly. for our listeners. Um, yeah. So Nancy, just in that context, then what are some of the opportunities that DMOs like Tourism Richmond offer yeah. event organizers and event planners? It, it's a really interesting business that we do, or I guess, you know, set of set of things that we do when we work with an event coordinator, an event organizer, event organizer, an association or, you know, corporate meeting planner. It really runs the gamut. And, and what I always say is we can be the one stop shop for a particular event. Um, depending on what it is. So we can help with um, sourcing venues. We can help with sourcing speakers. We can help with um, community legacy pieces that um, many corporate planners are really trying to, you know, kind of think about as, as we think about what, what the, the role of business events is within any community. Um, but really our, a DMO can be um, part source person and part, you know, connector but also help in some funding opportunities as well. Some do, and, and our organization certainly does that. We have a very robust incentive program because we understand that it's a very competitive environment out there. And we, will, we really wanna make sure that um, our destination um, has some unique attributes that we wanna promote and, and, and talk about. And we use financial incentives to help us close some of those deals sometimes. But think about the DMO or the CVB as kind of the one-stop shop for whatever the client needs are. And, and that really depends on the event size, location, and, and what you're looking for in terms of offsite or convention center, conference center, ability, that kind of thing. So it really runs the gamut. And, and it really is the great thing about working with organizations like ours is that we can tailor a program, help you tailor a program so that's actually the right fit for that particular city or that destination. So it's a pretty unique uh, set of skills that we offer. And there's a team that sits behind me that really helps to close the loop on whatever whatever the particular organization or meeting planner needs to have within, within their particular type of event that they're doing. I love that besides just the support that you provide, but like the incentives that you are offering to like really, really support that. It's so cool. We source... Um, me and my team source one retreat every year. And the biggest thing that makes that deciding factor for us is a place that's willing to partner with us in some way. Like it's just because you're, you're going out and you a lot of times don't know anything about the destination. And so just obviously there are DMOs all over, but you can tell which ones are willing to partner with you or just really like don't have time for you to be, to be clear. <laughs> and so I, I love the way that you put it. And I think that's really important and something that a lot of meeting planners probably experience. Um, but if someone maybe hasn't worked with a DMO before, at what point should they get in contact with you? And like, at what stage in that process do you think you can be the most helpful for them? Yeah, I mean, 
you know, it, it's, it's an interesting question and there's no one right answer is what I would say. Um, you know, we get involved sometimes in the very early stages and we work you know, we work to promote our destination, um, talking to meeting planners, even maybe before they're thinking about Richmond as a, a particular place. But they know they need to go somewhere. Maybe they're going from the eastern side of the country to the western side of the country. So those initial conversations are all about what is the destination? What can the destination do uh, as as a differentiator for your particular meeting and who we are as as something that can be you know quite unique for for that particular planner so that's at the very early stages and that's when our job is really about talking about how how we can um, make your delegate experience unique and exciting and will generate the most revenue for your association or or will will generate the most uh, exposure for your corporation so that's the early stages but then if we so then it may come through a hotel for example married international obviously very large sales team that many planners will go to and so the hotels will bring us in at a certain point when they know that it makes sense for the dmo to to again whether it's offering that incentive or offering more destination um, information so that's in kind of the middle stages i would say and then once the contract is signed and they're looking at the programming and they're looking at, OK, here's here's the type of event we're trying to do. Um, Tours of Richmond, who can who do you recommend as an expert in uh, your neck of the woods that can help us make sure that our event is very unique and very different? And, and what kind of offsite venues can you offer? What things can our delegates do? Uh, what restaurants should they eat at when they're actually at the hotel? Always. In Richmond, certainly one of the most uh, one of the most um, uh, uh, common questions is where do we eat? Because we have an incredible and diverse si dining scene here, uh, very unique within uh, North America, actually. And um, I think it really is we can we can be brought in at any stage, essentially, and it really is dependent on what the event organizers need. Um, but I would always urge at the early stages is better. In, in, in a lot of ways, because we can help with some of those incentives that I talked about that can really help, you know, just kind of close the deal, so to speak, and make sure that that you're getting um, the most benefit you can from the CBD. Before we continue, here is a word from our sponsors. Richmond is where Canada's iconic coastal lifestyle is infused with Pacific sensibilities, a place that is real, raw, and unvarnished. Less than 25 minutes to downtown Vancouver, BC, Richmond is home to over 20 major hotel brands, most offering free round-trip shuttle services to the award-winning Vancouver International Airport. Mary and I had the opportunity to visit in the spring, and listeners, if I can't tell you how excited I am about this destination, it was amazing. We went whale watching out of this historical fishing town called Steveston. We also had the opportunity to tour a bunch of their unique venues, including a couple Olympic venues, my sports fans out there. And we got to eat our hearts out at this largest Asian night market in North America. I had sushi tacos I'm still dreaming about. Mary's got a ramen donut she can't stop thinking about. And I got to have her try a couple Korean and Chinese favorites of mine. So we were never short on memorable moments in Richmond. And all of, all of that is not enough, listeners. If you are an event host or an event planner, there is significant funding available for both bid phase and booked event costs. We love helping you make your budget go farther. So create your conference on the coast and head to visitrichmondbc.com for more information. Yeah, Nancy, in, in my role of what I do, I haven't had to work with a lot of DMOs that much or as a part of the early stages. I've, again, worked with some on site. But I I mean, after my experience with you guys, I, I feel like it's a no brainer for planners and organizers to get in touch with the DMO. I think of it as like you have a best friend who knows the city, this destination, this location inside and out to save you the legwork of having to figure out where to go. Uh, I was saying I'm still dreaming about that sushi taco that I had at the Richmond Night Market. Uh, and there's nowhere in Seattle for me to get a sushi taco. So I'm going to have to go back to Richmond, BC and get it. <laughs> Your dreams can be realized again, Logan, by coming back up and uh, going back to the night market running till mid-October. Uh, and it runs in the summer. So so but but again, and that's that's, I think, indicative of what many meeting planners now and kind of this post-COVID world are really looking for that unique and memorable experience that 
is potentially outside the ballroom. Maybe it's in the ballroom too, but maybe it's outside the ballroom and they're looking for something that the delegates can really hold on to. And, and, you know, in tourism, we talk about transformative experiences and very memorable experiences and every community has those and every community has something to offer. And, and it's exciting when you're, you know, the meeting planner and you're actually trying to uncover what those are, that's going to be best suited to, to what your delegates want and what they need. And that's where the magic happens, frankly. And that's where we can really, you know, bring a lot of value uh, to to the to the organizations, um, corporations, associations, et cetera, to help them get to something a little bit different than maybe they did before. And and we see this trend within uh, within you know the the meetings world um, and events world is unique, unique, unique. Is we're really, really everybody's pushing for that and. It's so cool because, you know, when we couldn't meet in person, you know, we, we realized what we were missing. And now that we're back together in person, uh, it, it's just so magical because there, there's so much there's there's so much richness in coming together and then being in a destination where you can, you know, have a sushi taco or you can go whale watching or, you know, you can, you know, see see an incredible Olympic venue um, like we have at the Richmond Olympic Goals. So there's there's a lot of things, a lot of elements to that. But but ultimately, that uniqueness about the destination is really what we can help on cover uh, with uh, with the respective event team. Which is so much more than a Google search, like the amount of like, just in case. Of or AI search Google too, it. or even an AI search. So yes, yes, it, it is different and it is better to go straight to the DMO for those really unique experiences, like you were saying. So um, what are the budget implications though, for working with a DMO and what does that normally look like? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good one. And, you know, there's no catch. Uh, there, there, there's not really a catch associated here. I mean, we work on behalf of our stakeholders and we work on behalf of our venue partners and we work on behalf of our restaurant scene and we work on behalf of our city. So uh, so we don't get funded through the event. Uh, essentially, the budget implications will be on the upside because we're going to help source the best uh, product, source the best, uh, you know, kind of suppliers that are needed for whatever particular type of event you're doing. And in addition, I think I mentioned uh, there's also many DMOs, many CBBs do have incentive programs or some version of an incentive program. Not all do, um, but some do. And that's something that you can certainly uncover very easily, whether on their website or, or whatever. So um, and, and I think that the, the budget implications are only very positive. And, you know, certainly as things have gotten more expensive over the last number of years and we're seeing inflation and we're seeing those those huge pressures on event planners uh, at every front, frankly, whether it's food or audiovisual or transportation, um, you know, we're looking at trying to, you know, create the conditions that are going to bring the most amount of events into our destination as I said, whether through financial incentive or service level or just uniqueness of, of the destination. And everyone's really working towards that same goal because the importance of business events in any destination can never be underestimated. And it's not only about economic benefit um, and those budget pressures are really important, but there's also a real cultural and social benefit to, to the destination by hosting these meetings and these, these uh, conferences and business events. Just to dial in on when you say incentive, that's usually it's like sometimes a credit to spend in the local market or some kind of, yeah. I don't, you know, no one likes the word discount, but just something yeah. that is, you know, giving you money. A money for your budget where, like you said, if things are tight, your dollar yeah. would go farther working with a DMO that has an incentive program, like you mentioned. And they do different people structure different way, uh, different ways. The example that I would use is our own, which is really based on a, a, a calculator, which is time of year, uh, size of event and, you know, type of type of event it is. So so it's a fairly, you know, it's a calculator um, and then there could be additional things on top of that. But but essentially um, it is about financial uh, incentives and that going to the bottom line of the event and uh, hopefully offsetting some of those costs that that really, you know, our partners have no choice but 
but to charge. They, they really don't uh, because of the pressures that everybody is feeling across every board right now. So um, so it's an interesting time in the events world. And I'm sure, you know, your listeners have, have definitely uh, encountered the challenges, but the desire and the need for people to come together, whether it's an event or a meeting or a conference, I believe it really off offsets all of that. And we need to continue, especially as a CBB or a DMO, we need to continue to make sure that that um, that desire, that need is continue to be stoked because uh, it's it's a very powerful opportunity Come anytime you come together with people in, in real life. And you have such an extensive background on the tourism side of things. Is there anything, you're, you're talking to event people here on this podcast, so is there anything you wish that event planners knew about DMOs? You know, I think that th this conversation is really important and I fully appreciate it. And, and I think it is that service level that probably some don't know. Uh, and, and, you know, we as DMOs need to do a better job talking about it and uh, promoting not only our destination, but actually what we can do on behalf of the event planners or, or the associations. And, you know, that's incumbent on us to, to get that message out there. But, you know, I think the, the, the one thing I would just say is, is just the ability for us to, um, you know, know our, know our destination really unlike anybody else uh, within within the industry and use that and use that knowledge and, you know, milk it for all it's worth because it will just make your event better. I really believe that. And and I think that the, the proof that uh, we've seen it, we've seen it time and again where, you know, they need a they need a connection to a local speaker or they wanted to do a unique tourism experience. And because we're both the destination marketer and the business event, um, you know, kind of de business development group, we do have that unique piece where we can really, um, you know, tailor tailor the, the concept or, you know, the event to what the event planner needs. So that's 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 probably the one thing I would say is just, you know, use us and uh, and really, you know, work with us and, and really understand how we can how we can make things better. Yeah, I think it's really applicable because like even if there are some, you know, event professionals listening to this that don't travel to do events, I still think that there comes a time when you don't know what you need and then all of a sudden you're going to be presented with some opportunity and you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I, I like need a resource for this. I just think that like the likelihood of that happening is actually pretty high even if you don't produce events often in other locations and totally. so it really is something that like if you're listening to this like don't tune it out because there's going to be a time when you're probably going to be like oh my gosh yes I we work with a lot of local event producers as well mary yeah. you know it, it's not only about i mean the room nights within the hotels are great but but you know there are a lot of other opportunities especially within um you know richmond vancouver and the area around our our destination where there's a lot of things happening all the time and and there's a need for venue space and and we certainly see ourselves as as helping people out not only from you know kind of exterior to our our destination but also within our destination because my my point to that to my team is always well you just never know when things are going to come and and you just never know what they're going to need and where those opportunities are going to arise so it's always about high service level high touch and then being that person who can help connect the dots where maybe some of the dots are not quite as clear sometimes. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. And something that's really helpful is to hear examples. So would you mind sharing a few examples of successful cases that you've had with Tourism Richmond and working with other planners on events? Yeah, you know, there's one that comes to mind, um, which was a really interesting one. It was just kind of on the tail end of COVID. They were looking for uh, a destination for, you know, pretty small event, 250. But these are very well known. Um, well, not well known. The, the people aren't well known, but the group is well known academics. And so so the, the organizers came to us. They did a site visit and there's, yeah, Richmond is great. We, we want to come here. But they really needed us to connect to to some of the key areas, um, subject matters that they wanted to talk to at the ac academic level. One of them was sustainability, and that was uh, that's something within our region in Richmond and Vancouver we're very well known for um, sustainable events, but also sustainable practices, not only within the tourism industry, but within kind of the entire different different uh, industry sectors as well. So we were able to connect th that group with a number of different 
good speakers, academic speakers. They used us. They used our contacts, and we were very help, very happy to help. Um, you know, kind of provide that area of expertise and make those connections. Um, and then the other part, um, which which was really interesting and has become much more prominent and much more important is around um, welcoming and uh, the Indigenous welcomes that that we need to make sure that we're acknowledging, um, certainly within Canada and I'm sure within the U.S. as well, making sure that we're acknowledging, um, you know, our part uh, and how we can connect uh, and, and really acknowledge some of those Indigenous groups with whoever the, the de- whoever the organizers are. And often it comes in the form of a welcome, which is very powerful and kicks off uh, you know, events in, in a really good way. And, and it's very powerful. And that's a way that we can also help because we can help those. The, um, and we did this with this particular academic conference that I talked about. We helped them um, with not only the kickoff, but they also wanted to do something special on one of the gala nights as well. And so we were able to really, you know, make it very, very special, connect them to the right group and make sure that we were, you know, connecting all of the dots there and, and, really understanding how we can be that um, that go-between. And it was very much appreciated from the event organizers, but also what I heard from, from the actual delegates as well. And so it really, it really is about, um, and that, that particular example, this is a very discerning group. Um, they've been, they go all over the world and they wanted to come to Western Canada and we knew that and we had an opportunity to showcase who we were and they were, they were very welcoming on that opportunity and very successful uh, result for them. So, um, so that was really, that was really, really cool. One, one particular example. And I think a great, great example, like you said, it's not something you can Google or have AI. I'm lumping them in my head together because I know AI pulls from (laughs) Google results. So it's, those are things that you wouldn't be able to find on your own, or if you did, it would take the amount of time, which as event folks, we care about the money and the budget, but we also care about time. I mean, that, that the time is really important and and that's where you can circumvent some time um you know and, and everybody's going to need to do their own research about where the destination is what you know what's unique about the destination is there an airport there what's the trans like all that kind of stuff right but but in terms of you know the the table stakes of of events and event management the research that you know people like you and your listeners need to do um, we can certainly shortcut some of those steps for sure uh, I am curious, Nancy, is there anything you wish the event industry did differently from your perspective? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Um, you know, I think I think one of the things we've noticed, the trends in the last, you know, since COVID, and, and this is not only the event industry, this is a lot of things. Things need that that people want responses yesterday. I mean, like literally. And and sometimes, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to kind of flesh something out and and get the responses that we need. So I I I think that we're all in hurry up mode right now. And and we are and and we are absolutely going to respond as a client needs. But I would really sometimes we just need a little bit of time. So so just be, I would just be patient, but understanding the pressures of, of where things are at right now. But, but I think, you know, we do, we do want to make sure that we have the ability and the, you know, kind of the time that it will take to get the right type of proposal so that we can showcase our destination in the best way and, and get our partners on board and get the right costings, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think it's the, it's the hurry up and we need it today or yesterday. Um, but maybe we can just try to, you know, moderate that just a little bit. If I could, if I could just ask for one, for one thing, um, that would probably be the one thing. And, you know, I'm absolutely cool with, uh, people, um, asking for things that are totally crazy and totally outside of, you know, the, the norm that, that is awesome. We love that. Um, so it's not that it's more just about the time. So, uh, that would be the one thing that I, I would request respect. I think that's a fair ask. It's a yeah. fair ask. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. And, and, and everybody's under the same pressure, right? Including us. And, and, you know, I've got to respond to my board too. So it's all good, but, but it's, it's more about, let's think about what, you know, what the best quality is going to, you're going to get the best quality from. So. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure you could probably talk for hours about, but could Gosh. you share with us some of your favorite things about Richmond, BC? Right. Richmond, D.C. is a very unique place and and it is, uh, you know, adjacent Vancouver, British Columbia is, uh, you know, our biggest suburb. 
immediately to the north. Uh, we are the home of uh, the international airport that services this region, uh, 26 million passengers per year. Um, the top airport, 13 of the last 15 years running, I think, in North America. So, so there, those are the kind of, you know, the kind of the, 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 the logistical things. Um, as I said, two and a half hour drive from Seattle and uh, really well placed as a jumping off point to all points in North America and all points in British Columbia. But when you get to the heart of, of the destination and, and you think about what makes us a little bit different, um, we're a series of islands and, uh, you know, one of the biggest islands or the island with the most of the city of Richmond is on, it's called Lulu Island. And um, it's a very interesting history and we're basically surrounded by, it's very flat and we're surrounded by a diking system um, that uh, is very robust and it is a trail that you can bike. And you can bike 80 kilometers of trails within uh, within the city of Richmond. So, the biking, and that's one of the things I think you talked about. You know, the activity, um, the activity levels, whether it's biking, bird watching, uh, walking, running, uh, and whale watching. Th those activities are really cool and and really get at the heart of of who we are. And as an island kind of city, I guess I would say, uh, which is very adjacent to some incredible natural assets on the Pacific Ocean and the Fraser River. It's absolutely stunning. And then when you think about the cultural side of, of Richmond and you think about what is Richmond, uh, we have a very unique history. And uh, back in the early 1900s, the, the city was actually built on the back of the fishing industry. And it brought together indigenous groups, um, Japanese people, Chinese people, all in, in kind of an area called Steveston now, which is an authentic kind of fishing village and home of two national historic sites as well. So, so that was kind of the birthplace. And then through the years, Richmond has become this mecca for um, other people from all across the world who want to come live in Canada and uh, live in Richmond because of its location, its natural beauty. And uh, we, have, we are very fortunate to be the home of a very large amount of descendants, um, whether it's first, second or third generation Chinese immigrants and um, from Hong Kong and from mainland China as well. And it's quite it's quite intriguing. Um, sometimes when you're in a mall in in Richmond, you feel like you could be in Hong Kong um, or you feel like you could be in uh, Beijing. It's, it's a really, really interesting place. And what that has done for this destination, not only is it culturally diverse, but it means that the food is outstanding. And, and um, you know, I talked about the fishing village, there's fresh seafood you can buy off the wharf, take it to a restaurant, they'll cook it for you. But the Chinese food is is something to behold. And it is, uh, you know, sometimes a little intimidating for some people because they don't necessarily know what it is they're eating or why. Um, but for, you know, certain, um, for certain people, it's really intriguing. And we find that for delegates of, of events, um, they really enjoy the food experiences that we have uh, diversity of food. And that's something that really is quite, quite intriguing and always a lot of fun. And it really, um, that's one of our main, you know, kind of differentiating points, if you will, if I get back to my marketing, my marketing roots, um, the food scene here is really uh, different. And we've been written up uh, all over the world uh, about our food scene. You mentioned the Richmond Night Market, um, and that is the largest uh, night market in or the largest market in uh, in North America. And it really does make you feel like you're in um, a place a little bit different than uh, than North America. So it's always fun to um, see people experience that for the first time and just be, you know, fairly wowed by it. So so it's a very culturally diverse um, city and, you know, adjacent to nature, which is, um, you know, really British Columbia, what we are in British Columbia too. And, and the outdoors is very important to us and, and being an urban environment, but yet, you know, a 10 minute drive or 20 minute drive from, uh, or 30 minute drive from a ski hill is pretty, pretty cool to, to live in a place like this. So, so it, there's a number of different things, but I think ultimately it is um, very unique from our friends in Vancouver, but we're, you know, a really great complimentary destination um, to uh, the rest of the Pacific Northwest, but yet um, a little quirky at times. So it's good. I mean, I, Nancy, my favorite part, and Mary, I'll let you chime in for your favorite, but I mean, I still, all of the food, I joke, any destination that if I fall in love with the food, I fall in love with the place, the place. Exactly. and 
having been an expat in China, I, I just, I still am like so touched from your, the authentic Asian eats tour. You talked about people being intimidated, but that tour is amazing for anyone looking to get into figuring out maybe what some more authentic Chinese foods yeah. taste like. Um, yeah. And we actually, one of the stops, I got to actually speak some Chinese, which I haven't had to oh. do that for my job now in a little, in a while. Oh, that's cool. That's yeah. Cool. We met a, met a woman from Chengdu and she was so excited because I could speak Chinese and she made us a couple extra bonus dishes because she was just so happy and they were fantastic. That's how they say thank you. Oh just my gosh. Me- yeah. It was the best Dan Dan noodles I've had outside of China. And, and the night market is such a vibrant and funky, again, that sushi taco, you're probably sitting here listeners like, what is a sushi taco? Go to our Instagram because we post about it and follow Richmond Night Market on Instagram as well, because you'll be drooling every time you see pictures. Uh, but it was just, it was so much fun, I feel like for, and a surprise to be that close to Seattle and you're in Canada. And I guess I, in my head, I just never would have associated yeah. that you That's don't true. have to go that far to get really authentic like food. It was really, really good. I, I totally agree. And I think about the ramen donut from the Richmond night market all <laughs> yeah. the time that I've had a weird obsession with ramen lately. So to put it in a donut form, I think about it often. The it donut was, form. <laughs> yes. Yes. It was pretty amazing. But also the Britannia shipyards, right? They were very cool because I'm always looking for like unique things that we can do, unique venues even, because there are like opportunities to hold events kind of in that area, which still has cultural significance. And so it's just, it was, it was really unique to me. So that's something that I really remember as well. So I bet we could name a lot of things, but we had a great time. Yeah. So listeners truly check out our, our um, social yeah, media. You have a great time. And, and, you yeah. know, the historical significance of somewhere like the shipyard, especially is, uh, it's, it's quite profound actually in, not only in, in Richmond, but also, you know, from a Canadian perspective. And, you know, we have a very, very, very great long history of people coming from other countries and, and as, as you do in the U.S. And it's uh, it's very powerful. And, uh, you know, embracing those cultures and, you know, kind of also respecting and understanding that people are coming from other areas of, of the world is uh, it's a gift, I think, for all of us. Amazing. Yeah. Well, Nancy, I mean, we could talk to you for hours at this point, but is there anything else that you would like to add for our lovely listeners? You know, I think I think the one thing I would add is just re- emphasizing the point about you know what the CBB or DMO can do for you, you know, in a way, and and that's that's something that you know I really appreciate you bringing up and and you know really kind of bringing to the forefront. This is very very important, and you know as we think to the future and again the competitive nature of our world uh, and how we can all do things in a way that is uh, different, unique, and and brings innovation to the core of what we do, we can help do that. And and that's that's something that, um, if I can leave you with one thing, um, yes, Richmond is awesome, but so are DMO. So that's that's what I would say as well. And and uh, I really appreciate the, the time, the time today. Amazing. Thank you, Nancy, for being here. We really appreciate it. Great. Enjoy. Enjoy the rainy day. It is a rainy day today. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> All right. Okay. Take care. And Mary, you have our bonus tip this week. I certainly do. Our bonus tip is unrelated, however, maybe oddly a little bit related because it is about hotels and it's a travel tip as well. So I recently stayed at a hotel and they had something that was really cool. So this is more of a, if you're in the, in that side of the industry, the hospitality and hotel tourism industry, maybe this is a tip for you, or just if you travel, this is something fun. Maybe you could look for. So I recently stayed at a hotel and they had a door hanger that was in your room that you could fill out your breakfast order on and you they said put it out on your door by 1 a.m and you circle the time that you want your breakfast delivered and so you just put it on your door and the next thing you know that time at that morning you get a knock on your door and there's your breakfast and it was amazing because I was working an event and I you know we like to plan and so it was great because I didn't have to do any morning rushing to get breakfast it just already was scheduled for me and I thought about it the night before I don't know if you've experienced this before Logan but it was awesome. I love that. Yes. As a busy anybody, I feel like even if you have meetings and all that good stuff, getting to like have one less thing to worry about. Uh, that's, that's a great one. Thank you, Mary. Sounds like we want to take advantage of it or start doing it if you're a hotel. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I love it. Well, listeners, that brings us to the end of our episode. Before I do our standard close, I do really want to plug Mary and I had so much fun in our visit to Richmond, BC, and we've done recaps on social media. We'll post more. We will post when this episode drops specifically the ramen donut that Mary can't stop thinking about and the sushi taco that I can't stop thinking about. 
We're also totally open. If you want to travel with us, maybe we'll go back there together. Just take a whole group of Better Events listeners. We love it. Um, but you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and on LinkedIn at Better Events Pod. You can send us an email at bettereventspod at gmail.com. You can also connect with Mary and I directly on LinkedIn. We love hearing from you as well. We also are very thankful to our Better Events community that has launched a couple months ago. We're so grateful. We had our first community meetup last month, and it was just so much fun to get to see and connect with you. So follow us on Substack. It is a paid community. As a free member, you get access to a couple posts, but the paid community is where it's at. So as always, we want to thank you for listening, and we'll be back in your feeds again next Wednesday.